everyday injustice. Too many wrongful convictions, corruption has infected the criminal justice system. Leaving too many people helpless, fighting for their lives instead of receiving justice, people suffer. Is that why they say justice is blind? Hello and welcome to the Everyday Injustice Podcast. I'm your host, David Greenwald. For the past 10 years, we've operated Vanguard Court Watches in California, including San Francisco, Sacramento, and Yolo counties. Our goal? Expose everyday court injustices, and now, more broadly, shine a spotlight on injustices in the entire criminal justice system in the form of wrongful convictions, police and prosecutorial misconduct, and mass incarceration. This podcast hopes to take it a step further and highlight criminal justice reform on a national level. Everyday injustice. Today on Everyday Injustice, we have Simon Cole, the director of the National Registry of Exonerations. Welcome to our show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So um, what does the National Registry of Exonerations do? Um, the National Registry of Exonerations is an online living archive of all known exoneration cases in the United States. So we're trying to keep track of, um, of these events and um, so that people can understand what they mean for the criminal justice system. And how was it started? Um, it was started by uh, the University of Michigan Law School, uh, Professor Sam Gross there and Northwestern um, School of Journalism, uh, Rob Warden, a journalist there. Um, you can see it as um, it actually was originally meant to be the Encyclopedia of Wrongful Convictions. And that was just around the time it occurred to, to them that actually an online archive would be more useful and not and, and more long lasting. But you can see it as kind of the culmination of all the attempts to build lists of wrongly convicted people in this country, which go back to the to the 1920s and to kind of gather all those various lists into one comprehensive place. And, and what is your role in this organization? Uh, well, I'm a co-editor. Um, so along with uh, Professor Barbara O'Brien, um, I edit all the stories that go up on the website. We have a, a professionally written story about every, every new case that we post. Um, all 3,000 plus of them. Um, also the sort of social science coding of those cases so that we can find out things about them, demographic variables, the contributors to the wrongful convictions and, uh, and things like that. Plus running the organization and in this, the time left over to do, uh, do research projects and reports and so on. And how did you become involved in this? Uh, I became involved because uh, Professor Sam Gross, who was the co-founder of the registry, was looking for a succession plan. And um, uh, UC Irvine had a kind of cluster of faculty with expertise related to um, wrongful convictions and the use of science in uh, the legal system. So it was one of a few universities that was a possible logical home. Um, I had always been kind of on the periphery of the innocence movement because of my work on forensic science um, and debunking fingerprint identification and things like that, but never really involved in an organization uh, in the innocence movement. And I always wanted to, and this seemed like a great fit because it's a, it's a research organization, not a, not a legal or advocacy organization. So it fits with the university mission and our jobs as professors. And, you know, I really feel like uh, the National Registry of Exonerations has, along with the work of, you know, innocence organizations has really uncovered a whole host of flaws in the criminal legal process um, that um, 
became undeniable when when you have people that are you know exonerated uh, by DNA, you know beyond any doubt uh, that they didn't do it. All of a sudden, people couldn't claim. Well, you know, people, everybody claims to be innocent, but nobody's actually innocent. Yes, I mean, I think the the DNA exonerees were crucial in kind of overcoming that skepticism about whether that really occurs. And then they kind of stood for all the other exonerees who um, who were exonerated, but not by DNA. And um, and and then all the wrongly convicted people who we still may not know about, who may not have the evidence or the wherewithal to prove their innocence. But really through the work of the registry, we now have, you know, the, at least you could say the start of a data set um, to, to actually be able to analyze the data and look at what went wrong, why were people wrongly convicted, things like that. Yes, yeah. And, you know, from your perspective, what have we learned through this process? Um, well, we've, we've learned about, um, if, if you look at the registry as a data set, um, we've certainly the, the if you can just look at the, what we call the contributing factors, the things that led to these wrongful convictions and just go right down the line and identify them as problems in the criminal legal system. Um, they are kind of the problems that people have been talking about for a long time and that we knew about even from the earliest days of, um, of, of the innocence movement. Um, eyewitness identification, false confessions, forensic evidence, um, misconduct, um, poor defense lawyering, and, and so on. Um, I think the registry has um, highlighted the importance, especially of um, official misconduct, uh, which is our term that combines prosecutorial and police misconduct, that that just occurs in a, an enormous number of the cases, more than half. Um, so some, often these contributing factors, you know, coexist in one case. Um, and, and that kind of makes sense. The, the official misconduct goes, up, goes along with the other problems in, in the case. Um, the other thing that came out from the registry that uh, people hadn't looked at as much as what we call perjury and false accusation, uh, which is distinct from eyewitness misidentification where someone genuinely makes a mistake in an eyewitness identification. But, uh, and, and false accusation can, can include a lot of things, including intentional lies, informants, and so on. But, but the, that somebody said that this person did it turns out to be an incredibly, in fact, the most common um, factor in these wrongful convictions. Yeah, and so, you know, you have kind of two levels, right? Somebody saying that they saw somebody do something. Um, sometimes it's an innocent mistake. And what you're saying is sometimes it's not an innocent mistake. Uh, yeah, th that that's right. And some, sometimes it's, uh, right. I wouldn't have been as a narrower category of, um, I actually saw this person at this place. Um, whereas the accusations can can just be, I heard that this person did it, or this person said that this other person said that this person did it, and so on, um, as well as false accusations made by the police and, uh, and other um, government actors. I was kind of surprised to learn, you know, through reading that we've kind of known that uh, even eyewitness evidence was problematic uh, for probably a hundred years now, um, which is kind of shocking because I think, you know, courts rely so much on eyewitness testimony, uh, you know, in criminal proceedings that without that, it, it would seem very difficult for, for the system to function unless you had, you know, physical evidence. Yeah, that's right. Um, the experiments, Kind of showing that 
eyewitness identification didn't always work as you would hope it uh, would go back to the turn of the 20th century as some of the earliest experiments in, in the field of psychology and law. Um, I think that, uh, you know, the, the, the legal system heavily values um, the, a person who says they saw what happened, right? And so it's, it's very much a part of the culture of, of the trial. And, and so it's very difficult for the legal system to, to give up on in, entirely. Um, and uh, it, it was really with the, with the DNA exonerations that you got this kind of irrefutable evidence that even very confident eyewitnesses could be wrong and mistaken and, and, and well-intentioned eyewitnesses as well. Yeah, in fact, we, we now know that just because somebody expresses a high degree of confidence in their identification doesn't actually mean that they're right. Yeah, that's right. Psychologists say that uh, confidence is not a um, is not a predictor of accuracy. So you can't just assess the accuracy of the eyewitness identification by thinking about the witness's confidence. So, I mean, it seems like the system has been slow to kind of accept some of this stuff. I've been, you know, in courts for the last 15 years or so and, and have seen a, a, a very slow evolution of accepting some of this stuff, but a lot of, you know, what the Innocence Project and the Registry have discovered about wrongful convictions has yet to filter its way into the courtroom. Well, I, I think there's a glass half full and half empty on that uh, question. Um, certainly, you're right that there's lots, lots of more work to be done. Um, on the on the other hand, you know, to to begin with, um, our legal system continues to exonerate people. So, um, uh, you know, we're posting a new exoneration almost every business day. Um, of the year. So on the one hand, that means we're falsely convicting a lot of people, but it also means we are eventually exonerating a lot of people. And it's important to remember that, you know, that, that we are still doing that, especially if you compare it to um, the legal situation in, in other countries where that might not be occurring. Um, and, and I think there has been some progress, certainly an awareness of the, of, of the issues with eyewitness identification, which we were discussing, um, false confessions. I mean, the notion that somebody can falsely confess, right? There's, there's a long way to go. And, and you guys recently or relatively recently did a study on uh, official misconduct, police and prosecutorial misconduct. Uh, what, what kinds of findings did you find um, yeah, well, I wasn't the lead author of that, or even an author of that study, but um, as I said, it, it's the second leading contributor to wrongful convictions um, after perjury and false accusation. Um, it includes both um, police and prosecutorial misconduct. Um, and into this one, cat we, we lumped them together into this category called official misconduct. Um, it's actually about half and half. It's about equally divided between police and prosecutorial misconduct. Um, the, the most common form of prosecutorial misconduct is concealment, um, uh, concealing uh, evidence that would be helpful to the defense. So you know, in, in legal terms, Brady violations. Um, uh, just in, in incredibly common thing. Um, and the police are more, um, more varied in terms of um, also concealing evidence, um, threatening witnesses, suborning perjury, um, violence in some cases, things of that nature. So really a whole litany of, of um, bad actions that, that can occur by government actors in those cases.
do we think this is nefarious or do we think that this is just tunnel vision and they're kind of thinking that they're getting the right guy and and then cutting corners in order to get them? Um, I, I think it can be a little bit of both. Um, there's certainly some uh, some nefarious cases in the registry, and there's also patterns of misconduct. So rogue um, police officers or rogue police units that then produce a lot of exonerations because there's an investigation and they start looking into their other cases and they find, you know, there's lots of instances of this. But there's also lots of the kind of sort of this is routine behavior that wouldn't nobody would have noticed if it hadn't blown up. Um, so some of it is, I think, bad habits that uh, that that people were in. I and then some of it may be tunnel vision, and I think that's why you see it co-occur with the other things like forensic evidence or eyewitness identification that. If you have an erroneous eyewitness identification, the the official actors might think, yeah, this is the person. And so we need to just do a little bit to help the case along, um, you know, conceal some of this exculpatory evidence or um, or threaten the witnesses because we've got the right guy and we because we trust the eyewitness or the confession or whatever it is. Um, and so it's justified to to. Um, uh, to kind of help help the case along. Um, do you have like any uh, anecdotal stories, uh, you know, of these kinds of cases that jump out? Um, well, there's there's so many um, anecdotal uh, cases, but um, we've been uh, over the last year we've been publishing. Um, some of these pattern cases that I described before, so cases that have been produced by investigations into um, uh, rogue police officers. Um, uh, and so we've been publishing a lot from two cases, two groups of that. Um, uh, one be, being the uh, the unit led by a detective named John Burt. Both of them are from Chicago, of course, which, depending on your view of it, is um, surprising or entirely predictable. Um, but uh, so some de detectives led by a detective named John Burge who were literally beating and torturing um, suspects uh, routinely for years. And this has uh, produced a lot of exonerations. Um, and, and, and the other is kind of interesting because it's also in Chicago, but it's kind of the other end of the crime spectrum. It's a, um, a, a unit um, led by a, a, a sergeant called Ronald Watts, um, uh, where it's all drug crimes. So they were simply um, shaking down um, Drug, either drug dealers or simply residents of the housing projects, um, planting drugs on them to make their arrests, uh, stealing their money, um, and uh, essential and and fabricating cases against hundreds of people now. Um, so, and again, in kind of routine behavior. So, those are um, <laughs> those are pretty extreme. Yeah, um, you know, I've read pretty extensively on John Burge and, uh, you know, um, the the Chicago torture cases, um, which, uh, by the way, is, you know, a big reason why Illinois ended up banning the death penalty um, because of the unreliability of uh, those convictions. And, and, and simply the intractability of figuring out who was innocent and who wasn't. Yeah, uh, you know, concern about wrongful convictions was, of course, pivotal in the um, in the uh, decision to um, to the blanket commutation and the ending of the death penalty in Illinois. Um, and my colleague at the registry, Maurice Posley, um, recently co-authored the uh, memoir of, of Governor George Ryan 
um, about his decision to, uh, which includes, of course, his decision to to end the death penalty in in Illinois. Um, yeah, but I got to I, uh, interview Governor Ryan, um, I think last year. Um, that was really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, but I was going to say, when you asked me for anecdotes, I would yeah. encourage um, your listeners to just. Um, to just browse the registry, just go on and, and start looking at the, the recently posted cases because you'll never know what you'll find. And some of the stories are just um, are just amazing and, and surprising and shocking and sad, but also very interesting. Yeah, recently um, we learned uh, that uh, an exoneree, Gloria Killian, uh, had passed away. And um, I, I jumped on um, to, to see if I could find uh, some background on her. And sure enough, uh, I found uh, her page on the registry. And of course, Maurice had already updated uh, uh, the entry to include her passing, uh, which had only been a couple of days. Uh, so he was, he was on it. Yeah, I, I met Gloria a couple times. Um, she's a very impressive person. And um, and you're right, a part of the work of the registry, I said we're publishing a, a case pretty much every business day, but part of the hidden work that uh, is less noticeable is uh, we've, we've got more than 3,000 exoneration cases now, and we're constantly updating them. Uh, because if we learn something like that, like somebody has has died or they've won compensation or they've been denied compensation um, or something else has happened in the case, we we immediately try to go and, and correct the record. Um, and that's now become a big job because that's 3,000 uh, cases to uh, keep up to date and current. So what's the current number of exonerations that have been identified? Um, so it's uh, over 3,200 uh, exonerations since 1989 uh, through the present. And the reason for the 1989 cutoff is, um, is of course, that that was the year of the first DNA exoneration. Um, not that we only count DNA exonerations, because we don't. We count all exonerations, not just of which DNA exonerations are just a small portion. But we do think 1989 is a reasonable cutoff to say that that was a new era in, um, in the innocence movement and in understanding of wrongful convictions um, in the United States. Um, because as you said earlier, um, DNA really did change things. And so it, so it seems a reasonable cutoff date. Um, we, we also, but of course, um, there, it's arbitrary and there's no reason not to count the ones that happened before 1989. So we started another registry um, to count the pre-1989 ones. And then um, we had cases where, uh, which we call group exonerations in which large numbers of people between, could be anywhere from 50 people to um, over to, to thousands um, are sort of exonerated in one fell swoop because of some kind of scandal, um, usually a police scandal or a forensic laboratory scandal. Um, and we needed a place for those. It's hard to put those in the individual registry. And so we created the third registry, which is the groups registry, um, which keeps track of, of those cases, which, which um, if, you, if you consider them exonerations, um, are thousands more exonerations. So, um, you know, going back to the 3,200, um, you know, how, what criteria are used to determine, okay, this was an exoneration? And, and how painstaking is that process? It, it's, a, um, it's a pretty painstaking process in terms of the rigor with which we try to apply our definition. Um, the, the definition is, is designed to, um, to capture factually innocent people and to exclude factually guilty people. 
um, as, as best we can, but it's not a perfect, we, we have no illusions that it's a perfect instrument for that, um, but we think it's the best that can be come up with, can, uh, that we can come up with. Um, but the crucial part is that it, it, it relies on the government to, um, to state that the person is no longer convicted. Uh, there's no one in there who we're making a judgment based on our judgment as researchers or as scholars or just as citizens that we think this person is innocent. In fact, there are lots of people who I might believe are innocent and I can't add them to the registry because they don't meet the definition. So to be exonerated, you essentially have to be um, uh, relieved of your conviction by the court, by, by the government. And that's either a judge or a prosecutor or some or a jury. Um, so it's either a judge um, or, or sometimes a governor with a pardon. Um, now, is it enough to simply vacate a conviction or do you need to the, uh, them to then be declared actually innocent? Um, no, th they don't need to be declared actually innocent because declarations of actual innocence are not really a legal thing. Um, except in some cases. So, um, so that doesn't happen very much. However, the conviction uh, not only has to be vacated, but it has to be vacated at least in part because of new evidence of innocence. So if, if the conviction is just vacated because there was an illegal search, which is the most common uh, form of vacation that we, we wouldn't count as an exoneration, that, that would not be an exoneration. So there has to be some evidence of innocence that, that leads to that vacation. So I'll, I'll give you a, an example of a case I know pretty well. Um, Maurice Caldwell was, um, had his murder conviction overturned in 2011, and then he ended up battling the state of California for the next decade as to whether or not he was actually innocent and therefore entitled to compensation, uh, as opposed to there simply wasn't enough evidence to retry him. Yeah, and is, is he in the registry? Um, I'm guessing he is. I, I, yeah. I didn't check, but yeah. I, I'd be surprised if he wasn't. It was an innocence yeah. project case. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I said earlier that. Um, that de declarations of actual innocence are kind of rare. Um, one place they do occur is in compensation boards. So a, a lot of states now have some kind of compensation scheme. And so we do treat when, when the state compensates someone um, because they were wrongly convicted, we treat that as a government statement that this person was wrongly convicted. Um, so, so yes, we would treat that, uh, that would be evidence that it's a, that it's an exoneration. And then, you know, kind of the standard question, you probably get this all the time, you know, how much of a tip of the iceberg is, uh, you know, that 3,200 figure, even since just 1989? Um, you know, we, Nobody really knows. Um, the little bit of social science evidence that there is on this um, are generally studies of the most serious crimes, the rape murders um, or death penalty cases. And that's where you get the, the figures that you've heard, you probably heard like around 4% of those convictions might be false convictions. Um, and, then, and then you have to ask how those extrapolate onto um, other crimes. But um, you, you, you really, um, we, we really can't really tell what the multiplier is of the actually exonerated to the falsely convicted who can't prove themselves, who can't prove their innocence or get themselves released. Um, one way I encourage people or my students to try to think about this is to read a case of exoneration and see all the lucky breaks that happen to this person to eventually get exonerated and then try to think about the people who might also have been falsely convicted but, but not have been subject to those uh, lucky breaks. And 
you know, of course, the most the best known one is is DNA evidence that the DNA of somebody preserved the DNA evidence, so it was there to test when they went looking for testing. But but that's by no means the only one. There are all kinds of other things of witnesses coming forward and um, um, good lawyers getting involved, um, the media getting involved, um, just. The Adnan Syed case, right? Um, there's a guy who was who was lucky because he got a lot of media attention. Do you think he'd be being exonerated um, without that? Um, so that that's how um, that's how I would uh, that's how I would think about it. I just saw the film um, about uh, Ricky Jackson um, in Ohio who at the time he was released in 2014 was the longest serving exoneree of all time, of 39 years, has since been surpassed um, by, by a number of exonerees, tragically. Um, but but um, 39 years later, he was able to be exonerated by, by the witness who, who had managed not to die um, during that time, despite a very rough, life and if he had no way uh you know it couldn't have happened uh and we wouldn't know about this case we would think it was a correct conviction yeah um we worked uh a little bit on a case out of north carolina where the guy had uh been in since i think 1976 and he got out last year so 45 years and then um, still working on one up in Northern California uh, where the guy's been in since 1978 and uh, he just got a big evidentiary hearing. So um, we'll be interested to see if he gets exonerated. But yeah, I mean, it's crazy. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we're seeing an increasing number of these um, exonerations of people who have served uh, you know, unthinkably long periods of time in excess of 40 years. And that very interesting phenomenon that I think it's a number of complicated causes, but it has to do probably with pe people living longer in prison, um, the innocence projects turning their attention to non-DNA cases, um, maybe greater, greater willingness to revisit these cases in the courts conviction integrity units which can uh, which can which were crucial in a lot of those cases um the 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 alleged um assassins of malcolm x is another one of those yeah yeah and you know um one of your other points i think is worth re-emphasizing you know it seems like in a lot of these cases, you have to be really unlucky to get wrongly convicted and then really lucky to get exonerated. Yeah, I, that's a that's a great um, truism. All right. Well, we're we are out of time. Uh, Simon, thank you so much for coming on and uh, sharing a bit about very fascinating work, in my opinion. Uh, Simon Cole from the National Registry of Exonerations. And what, what is the web address if people want to go look at it? Um, just Google uh, National Registry of Exonerations or Exonerations Registry, and it should bring you there. Great. Thanks so much. This has been Everyday Injustice. I'm your host, David Greenwald. Join us again next time for more tales from the injustice system. Thank you to George Powell and Norman Mouse Quake Barrett for the use of our opening Everyday Injustice. You can see more of George's music at www.justiceforgeorgepowell.com. That's justiceforgeorgepowell, all one word, dot com.